research. I don't think that you really believe that 9-11 was uh, the result of an intelligence failure. I mean, you're the master of uh, spies. What we know right now is that the FBI and CIA had five informants with first and last names. At the moment, Atta was on the watch list from the German intelligence since 1998. They knew exactly that there was a pending terrorist attack with hijacking planes. They had five war, war drills on that day. The NRO postponed their own drill, crashing planes into the headquarters. There was Amalgam Virgo in June uh, 2001, but they okay. exactly probed this. Right. They have all the names. All right, stop. Okay. Hold that, hold that. We, we hold can't that. make a dialogue and you will disagree. Not right me now, no. Right now, what I want to do is do this brief and then I will be here and I will answer your question at 2 o'clock this morning. If I survive, yes, but uh, no, no, until I'm sorry, then, please. 9 11 was an inside job and we will Bullshit. Do Have the courtesy to sit down. Movement. Crush him. <laughs> I will gladly entertain uh, heretical and lunatic positions later. Um, and I will tell you, there's lots of ways of looking at this. Uh, I've heard them all. I am probably the one person that has really studied the OSINT on 9-11 on comprehensively. And, um, and we will have the dialogue. This is a four-hour marathon session. Uh, but first, I want to go through the failure of 20th century intelligence. All right, I want you guys to have a context for having an intelligent dialogue. Not that you're unintelligent, but bear with me. Um, the bottom line here is that America is an industrial era country. We have an industrial era educational system. We have an industrial era media system with barons. We have an industrial era Congress, uh, which is completely ineffective at processing information. Uh, and we have an industrial era intelligence community. Now, a very quick history of intelligence. The original concept for intelligence was as secret wars between governments. Okay, so for centuries, that's been the primary focus of intelligence. How can we screw another government secretly? Okay, then Sherman Kent, after World War II and as part of the OSS, it took me three weeks to figure out open source solutions. I had the OS, but being a Marine, it took me three weeks to figure out the third word. Um, but originally, the OSS was conceptualized as a global open source intelligence organization that would use predominantly academics to do strategic intelligence based on open sources. Things like the price of oranges in Paris telling you whether the railway bridges had been bombed or not. Okay. Um, and he tried that. Hasn't been successful, but it remains valid. Where I think we need to go and where all these collective intelligence guys, if you Google on collective intelligence, you'll find everybody other than Robert Steele. Um, there are at least eight different bottom-up, self-generating groups that I think are very important. We need to move toward being a smart nation. A smart nation is a nation in which every one of us is an intelligence minuteman. Every one of us understands the process of intelligence. We know how to apply it to our work, whether it's art history or defending the neighborhood. We know how to do this. Now, some of the failures that we've had in intelligence, and by the way, I have to tell you with, with all earnestness, given a choice between incompetence and conspiracy, always go with incompetence, okay? And believe me, it, it is, incompetence is vastly more likely uh, in the U.S. government. And, and let me say on a positive note, this is a great country. You're smart people. We can survive massive amounts of incompetence in Washington, um, although I am getting worried. Um, we have basically ignored open source information. I was hired by one branch of the US government to go out and evaluate and monitor terrorist insurgent opposition websites because they weren't satisfied with what the national intelligence people were doing. In less than 60 days for under $60,000, we identified and evaluated 396 terrorist insurgent opposition websites in 29 languages, including Gaelic, Catalan, uh, Urdu, Farsi, all those normal ones. The only two languages we didn't do that we wish we had were Berber and Aramaic, okay? I have a secret. I'll share it with you. I don't insist that my translators be U.S. citizens eligible for clearances who speak the language at a shitty level. <laughs> I go for indigenous people that speak their own language at English at a four or five level on a scale of five and I use various cover mechanisms to have them work successfully for what they think is a European company concerned about risk, okay? 
this is not hard. If I can do it, why can't CIA? Now, I, I got to say, CIA is doing some things right, and we will have a, we will have a three-hour discussion, but we need OSINT. We don't do non-official cover. Uh, Jim Pavitt screwed this country uh, as director of clandestine operations. He and a guy named Ted Price and uh, several directors, Tenet, Deutsch, Woolsey, mediocrities, every single one of them. Going back to Stansfield Turner who gutted the clandestine intelligence service, firing all of the ethnics. We used to have a clandestine service that looked like the United Nations. I mean, we're talking turban Sikhs, the whole nine yards. And then we started going for white boys from Kansas uh, and young white boys from Kansas. CIA doesn't hire anyone over 35. I've done a press release. If you Google for clandestine service and Robert Steele, you'll probably see, and it's got my five-part solution. But we have been lazy and cheap. You cannot do clandestine operations from an official installation that has local guards that work for the local counterintelligence service. You just can't do it. Okay, and you're in dreamland if you think you can. Um, we don't do a processing. The National Imagery and Mapping Agency, and by the way, now that it's called the National Geospatial Agency, uh, NEMA stands for not interested in maps anymore. Okay, Jim Clapper has gone way over the top on, on uh, digital. One laptop for every 500,000 people. That was what he sent to NATO for Bosnia. Um, the NEMA report in December 1999 said essentially we have spent trillions on collection and nothing on processing. We process less than 10% of our secret images, less than 6% of our Russian and Chinese signals, less than 3% of our European signals, less than 1% of our rest of world signals. We, we, we process roughly a million out of several billions of intercepted calls um, on a daily basis. And by processing, I mean some form of cursory examination, okay? The reality is that when something like 9-11 happens, we're usually about 30 days late in processing it. Um, we miss it completely. And our people don't speak Arabic beyond the three level, by and large. We don't have data standards. I believe in open spectrum, open source software, and open source intelligence. We don't have geospatial attributes. In 1988, I told the General Defense Intelligence Program managers, of which I was one for the Marine Corps, I said, fellas, we're not going to get to automated all source fusion until we have both a time date stamp and a geospatial stamp. This is not hard to understand. But today, in the 21st century, we are still not doing geospatial tagging of all of the information that we're collecting worldwide. This is just flat out nuts. XML Geo, NS, NASA, uh, Google on XML Geo, NASA and particularly the NASA people at Moffett in Texas are trying to get XML Geo going. Uh, it's something I support and I would just like to see everyone voluntarily adopt a, some kind of geospatial standard coding so that any data has codes for the point on the earth that it refers to. We don't do all source mixing. I, don't get me started on security. Um, I believe in security. I believe in smart security. I don't believe in moronic security, which is what we have now. Um, compartmentation is the enemy of knowledge. I guarantee you the next 9-11 will happen not because we didn't know, but because we didn't share. Okay? We're going to know about 9-11 somewhere in the U.S. government, and because we didn't share, it's going to happen again. This is why NSA, I think, needs to be the National Processing Agency. Yeah. Yeah, no, but trust me on this. We can, we can, you know, one of the interesting things about aggregate data mining is that you're doing pattern analysis and you don't violate your privacy until you're known to be in contact with a terrorist, okay? I mean, aggregate data mining is a cool idea and pattern analysis is actually the heart of signals intelligence, not reading the content, okay? It's pattern analysis and you don't violate individual privacy until you have a, a really rock solid picture that says this guy is making repeated phone calls to a known terrorist safe house, okay? So I, I support privacy. I don't support the Patriot Act. I support privacy, uh, and I support smart intelligence, and I think we have to be serious about this. Um, one of the main problems we make in analysis is we try and put expertise, foreign languages, and security clearances all in the same person. By and large, that's almost mission impossible. 
Uh, we're focused on threats instead of opportunities. We have been focused on creating a military designed to beat Russia and China in state-on-state -state war. We have spent almost nothing on the other three threat classes, and we have spent almost nothing on stabilizing the world. Ambassador Mark Palmer has written a book called The, um, the Other Axis of Evil. It's about the 44 dictators that survived Saddam Hussein. There are 44 dictators in the world. Dictators, by definition, create failed states. And Ambassador Palmer recommends a new undersecretary of state for, for uh, democracy. And you have two assistant secretaries, one for the guys that agree to a leverage buyout, one for the guys that don't. Okay? I think most of them will agree to a leverage buyout. Um, and then over in the Pentagon, I want to have an undersecretary for peacekeeping uh, and humanitarian assistance. And I want to use the military machine to start delivering medicine and food and water. We don't do preventive investments. Okay. Um, our emphasis is on the local and the current, vice the global and the future. I love Stuart Brand's book, The Clock of the Long Now. Uh, it took me five years to read it because I really thought it was about a clock. But now I understand it's about teaching all of us to adopt what the Native Americans call seventh generation thinking. How does our decision today impact seven generations out? That's what we should be thinking about if we want our children and our grandchildren to have the quality of life that we uh, have today. And it's getting worse by the day. We have to teach our politicians. Politicians are getting away with murder today because we're not holding them accountable. They're basically spending three quarters of their time with their hand out. Okay. I see you guys as part of an army of volunteers that makes it impossible for Joe and Jane's six pack to sleep at night. Uh, they have to pay attention. Uh, I'm about to start a nonprofit in Stockholm and we're going to try and recruit retired intelligence officers from all seven tribes around the world to serve as volunteers to take an education package into every schoolhouse, every chamber of commerce meeting, every social club, every labor union to basically say, folks, we have to pay attention. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but this is really serious. If we don't pay attention, we are going to be screwed. Um, we fail to impact on the national budget. National intelligence has absolutely nothing to do with what the U.S. government spends its money on because our senators and congressmen are being bought off. In fact, I just posted something on, on OSS.net a couple months ago. Medical journals can no longer be trusted by the doctors because just about every medical article is written by someone funded by the drug company whose drugs he's talking about. Okay, I mean, we have lost our integrity across the board. So I have a simple reform. I think, I think companies have to pay taxes on what they tell their stockholders they made a profit on, and we do have to have global campaign finance reform. We have to end gerrymandering. We should have basically virtual constituencies. You, you select whatever party you want to be of, and then that entire state, everyone who's a libertarian gets to vote for the libertarian no matter where they live, okay? Um, and there are other reforms. I've, I've posted something on my website called Citizen in Search of a Leader. Um, and a lot of these ideas are Ralph Nader's, although he doesn't play well with others. Um, and I really would like to see, I don't think Kerry's gonna win. Uh, I think if Kerry wants to win, he has to use the Democratic Convention, as I said yesterday. So many of you were not, were not here then. I'll, I'll repeat this because I think it's important. If anyone knows John Kerry or John Edwards, please tell them they're not going to win unless they use the Democratic Convention to announce a national convention of all parties, including moderate Republicans, who will come up with a unity plank and a unity cabinet that will be announced in advance of the general election. And John Kerry, I've, I've told his staff, they don't listen, uh, but they've certainly heard from me more ways than one. I've said, you can't beat the Republican dog with a Democratic dog. You can only beat him if you're a dog catcher. And the dog catcher issue in this election is restoring the vote to the individual. Okay? We don't have that today. Half of America is disenfranchised, and a quarter of it is not paying attention. Um, policy failures, we fail to impact on policymakers. Our policymakers are loosely educated. They have gotten to where they are by being schmoozers, not by being smart. Um, 
Until 9-11, we had senators and congressmen bragging that they did not have a U.S. passport because nothing that happened overseas mattered to their constituents. Okay, now after 9-11, a lot of them still don't have a passport, and you should ask every single one of your congressmen and senators, do you have a passport? Do you study foreign affairs? Do you understand the intelligence failures? We have to educate them. We failed to win public support for intelligence. Bill Clinton let intelligence and defense uh, run to pot, no pun intended, um, because he was vulnerable on the draft dodging, pot smoking issues. And so he, built, he, he got Secretary Cohen, who is an enormous mediocrity, um, to basically be part of the military industrial complex and, and run the Pentagon into the ground. Um, we have to understand that national intelligence is not about spies and secrecy. It's about knowing. It's about understanding. It's about spending our money properly. It's about behaving properly. Bin Laden could not have asked for a finer result out of 9-11 than the invasion of Iraq. It brought the far enemy near. We failed to impact on what we buy. When I stood up the Marine Corps Intelligence Center, the first thing I ordered was a study. First, I had to get the Marine Corps to agree on what 69 countries uh, we thought were important. I had no particular intent when I selected 69, but a general felt uncomfortable with it. We said, okay, it's 67 countries and two island groups. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was a very prudish general. Um, but I said, I want this study to be unclassified with unclassified findings. And one of the things we discovered was that the Navy and the Air Force are building aircraft to a standard aviation day that is warm and not humid, 65 degrees and not humid. It turns out that the real world aviation day is 80 degrees and humid more often than not. And in six very important countries, including Afghanistan, it's over 6,000 feet in elevation, which means that all of these airplanes can carry half as much, half as far, and they can only loiter over the battlefield for five minutes at a time. This is not cool. Okay, cross-country mobility. We can't move in 79% of our countries other than on the, the roads and bridges that are in place. And oh, by the way, while well, we're busy building 97-ton artillery systems and 70-ton tanks, it turns out nobody sells a truck that weighs more than 30 tons to anyone in the third world. Why? Because the bridges can't carry them. This is what my 14-year-old would call a clue, okay? <laughs> We should not be building things that weigh more than 30 to 40 tons. Uh, line of sight distances. We spent incredible amounts of money being able to hit a gnat's ass at 3,000 meters. Well, it turns out the gnat has to be carrying an emitter for us to hit them. <laughs> but it also turns out most of the world is under 900 meters and it's covered by jungle canopy. Or it's urban or it's mountainous. Only one quarter, six countries, of the cases we looked at were actually fair. Fortunately for us, in the Gulf War, they were all there. Um, but by and large, in most of the world, you need to be able to kill things at under 900 meters under canopy, and the satellites can't help you, okay? Um, our satellites can find a grapefruit, but you have to tell them where it is, okay? That's why we couldn't find the scuds. Um, ports, airheads, it turns out we can't deliver in 50% of the ports. It's too shallow, there's no turning radius, there's no pier side, so we have to go to airheads. Well, the Air Force is build, busy building these long-range transports that won't fit on most airports, okay? The C-130 is still the most viable delivery system for most of the world. Um, and then C-4, anti-internet, open. I believe that NATO and the Partners for Peace cannot afford American NATO DOD standard communications. Uh, you know, I mean, we're going into places where we end up having to spend special forces teams with all of our secret radios. That doesn't work. We have to elevate the security of the internet to the point where anyone, anybody can play. And we can create come-as-you-are coalitions. And then OOTW assets, I'm just back from teaching at Fort Bragg, and one of the things we discussed is we desperately need a division of military police. We need a division of civil affairs uh, officers. We need a division of open source intelligence, public affairs, uh, liaison officers. Uh, we are just investing in the wrong things. We haven't impacted, I used to pay Sistran $1,000 a month to translate my website, but the Austrians in particular complained about the German. Uh, the French, of course, complained about everything. Um, 
Uh, and so I stopped, and it turns out, looking into it, the reason that Systran wasn't working was because Bill Gates keeps migrating and mutating his application program interfaces. Microsoft should not be a lawsuit, it should be a standard, it should be a law that any software program will publish its application program interfaces and the handshake will be stable for three years. Okay? This is real simple, and it wasn't my idea, it was John McCartney's, the father of AI. We had uh, the other hackers group that I'm a member of is the Silicon Valley hackers. Those are the guys with the money. Um, uh, John Gilmore, employee number five of Sun, uh, um, uh, Phil Zimmerman, uh, uh, Stuart Brand, Glenn Tenney, guys like that. And I try to go out there every two or three years because uh, that's where I get energized in another way. We haven't defined an agile security ar architecture. We failed to define generic functionalities. The bottom line is there's no analytic toolkit that we can all share. There should be. Uh, this slide is called the Catalyst slide. If you Google for Catalyst, you should find it. Computer-aided tools for the analysis of S&T. We knew at CIA in 1986 that we needed 18 functionalities on a desktop, including modeling and simulation, structured argument, um, uh, anomaly detection, all of this stuff, all these data conversion things. And guess what? In 1988, CIA made a decision that it would standardize on the IBM PS2, the dumbest terminal on the face of the earth. And the reason CIA made this decision, putting aside all of the stuff that we experts were saying about object-oriented programming and analytic tools and stuff, they said, yeah, but it's easy to have good security with the IBM PS2. If you want to be a moron and have good security, this is the perfect choice, okay? And so CIA had a lobotomy in 1988. Uh, we failed to provide for intelligence. All of these systems that we're building in DOD, all of this homeland security stuff, there's no money for the data. There's no money for the interoperability among agencies. Uh, homeland security is a monstrous deception on the public. Um, intelligence is being treated as a free good and it doesn't exist. Uh, commanders are still assuming that they'll get what they need, but in fact, no one's being held accountable for not knowing and not being able to get it. We can't do wide area surveillance. We still can't process. We're so busy building all these UAVs, but these UAVs are like looking at the battlefield with a straw, and there's no uh, technology yet practical for taking 15 UAVs and bringing it all together into a consolidated picture, which, by the way, is what I also want to be able to do with your cell phones. So if there's another sniper thing, I want an alert, and everybody with a cell phone just sticks it up, points it at random, and beams it back to uh, Scotty, and boom, we have a 360 uh, of that picture, completely voluntary. Um, we can't do real-time change detection. It's just terrible. Um, we can't do the last mile. We can't see under jungle canopy or into city streets. We can't find single individuals. It's a great book on the hunt for Pablo Escobar. But look at Noriega in Panama. We already had 12,000 troops in one of the largest CIA stations in Latin America in Panama, and we had to invade the country to get one guy. That's incompetence. That should have been a special ops team with silencers and good CIA intelligence. If, and by the way, Noriega had been told he had to get out of jail free card from the White House. The White House and Bill Casey told Noriega, you let us support the Contras from Panama and you can do all the drugs you want. Just like Brzezinski told Pakistan that they could have the bomb as long as they supported the war in Afghanistan uh, against the Soviets, okay? We're cutting deals out of the White House that are in complete violation of U.S. law. Um, and this is a nonpartisan. I'm not bashing any particular party. It's the nature of the beast. The U.S. Air Force now requires 24 hours in order to change a bombing package. In my day, you had civil air patrols that could hit anything. 24 hours. Oh, it's down to 24 hours. OK, well, depending on the mission. But in General Clark's book and in several other books, they're saying you have to give us 24 hours notice. Oh, please don't get technical with me. Uh, the point is it's a problem, OK? I want people on five-minute strip alert. I want mixed packages ready to go. I want stuff deliverable within one to two hours, just like I want a platoon of Marines anywhere in the world within 24 hours. We can talk about that later. Um, philosophical failure. <clears throat> We've confused secrecy with intelligence. We failed to create a generic intelligence discipline, and we failed to develop regional or global intelligence networks. Congressman Simmons 
is now personally taking an interest in open source intelligence, and we're trying very hard to get 125 million in end of year money for uh, a, a program. It's in my it's in my OSINT page. Basically, I want to put 10 million dollar open source intelligence collection facilities in each of the theaters, including Northcom, and I want them to be multinational. I want a data warehouse for sharing with NGOs. I want a digital history center for cutting the spines off Chinese and Islamic and other publications and creating the digital history, uh, and so on and so forth. I'll tell you something, the only thing that's going to protect us against terrorism and other ills is public sharing. Now, I don't know how come I understand this and the U.S. government doesn't. Um, I think you do. Uh, the bottom line is the new paradigm rewards sharing more than it rewards secrecy. Secrecy is an outdated pathological concept. There have been books written about this. Voltaire's Bastards, um, Ellsberg's new book is actually quite good on secrets, a memoir. And my review of Ellsberg's book will help you. Uh, basically, secrecy is pathological. Um, can't have smart spies in a dumb nation. I think the rest of the world has made a serious mistake in letting Americans lead the, uh, the whole global secret intelligence process. I am doing what I can to nurture the, the, uh, the people who are thinking about a European intelligence network. And one of the first things I told them was don't try and create a central intelligence agency for Europe. In the age of distributed information, central intelligence is an oxymoron. Okay? You need to have a network approach. Conclusion, spies only know secrets. Intelligence is about discovering, discriminating, distilling, and delivering answers. And I did my second thesis. I looked at every embassy, came to the, the three embassies where I'd served, um, and came to the conclusion that we were collecting roughly 10% of what could be known that was relevant to our interests. But then in sending it back by hard copy pouch to Washington, we were spilling 80%, which is where my informed guess comes from, that Washington is operating on 2% of the relevant international national security information. My former partner, Mark Lowenthal, who's the ADCI for analysis and production today uh, uh, within the intelligence community, uh, when he was staff director of the House Permanent Select Committee for Intelligence, he used to try and tell the clandestine service, you don't get points for collecting information in the hardest or most expensive way possible. But that's precisely what we keep doing because it benefits a corporation building it, and it benefits a congressman, your average congressman or senator is getting a 2.5 to 5% payoff from every contract that goes into their state. Okay, that's the standard. We need to make it so that we double their salaries and we cut off their hands if they take money from corporations. Um, and last but not least, I was a consultant to an intelligence community project that was trying to think about tasking and I said, wait a minute, you say the only thing you're trying to ask is, is which of the secret ints should you task? And they said, yeah. I said, there are three other questions you should ask first. First question you should ask is, do we already know this? And can we find it? And the answer is no, we can't find it. We don't know if we know this. It's too hard, so we get it again. The second question we should be asking is, if we don't already know this, can we get it from someone else? from another ally, from, a, from a, another member of the seven tribes, whatever. If we can't find it and we can't get it for free, can we buy it from the private sector at a price we can afford, a reasonable price, then time and security constraints and so on. And only if you can't find it, get it, or buy it should you steal it. The U.S. intelligence community has not matured to this point yet. Make sense or add value. One of the things that the national intelligence community is being told today by the Special Operations Command is that nothing they're producing is useful. When I was a battalion landing team adjutant, a very privileged position for, for a young second lieutenant because among other things it meant that when you went on a sh Navy ship you had what's called a conics box for your safes and there was always room for cases of beer that the Navy couldn't find because it was classified. Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, I was definitely the most powerful second lieutenant in Asia um, for a brief time. What SOCOM is saying is, don't bother sending us finished production, we need the raw data. And so where I think we're going to end up is with a distributed network that collects on demand, processes on demand, and produces on demand. And finished broadcast production is history, by and large. Um, 
It's about actionable answers, not secrets, not spies, not toys. And I really do truly believe in the proven craft of intelligence. I think you have some intelligence professionals you can be proud of. You also have some that should be, at a minimum, covered with honey and nailed down over an ant pit. Um, all right. Now, that's the end of the brief. It's 11. It's 11.15, let's say. What I want to do is take a 10-minute break. We're going to do the pins up here again. Let's take a 15-minute break. We'll do the pins again. And at 11.30, uh, I will start doing questions and answers. Uh, and basically, Laszlo, get the big Samoan guy. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask civil questions that are very brief, and you only get one question. Um, and then we'll do as much interaction as you want. I'll, I'll stay in this room as long as there are 100 people here, uh, which I think we've got right now. Okay? So 15 minute break and we'll do pins up here. How is this going? It's all right? Excellent. You're done with this, yes? Military actually flies helicopters. And Here, one of my precious military fits. Take a pin. All right, hold on. Let me give you a card. His nickname is Psycho. So you. But go ahead, sir. How are you going to address? How are you going to address data integrity in a distributed environment? By encrypting it. What if it's not any good before you encrypt it? Ah, then you hunt down and kill the person that put it up in the first place. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, at, at, at the other hackers conference about 10 years ago, we had an actual discussion about uh, personal templates and personal reputations. And it's really interesting because it preceded this whole blogging thing. By the way, all of my lectures are available on my website. Uh, don't try it with the modem. Uh, but if you have a high-speed line, you can easily download. And I have lectures that review the literature. Uh, so literature on emerging threats, literature on strategy and blowback and all this stuff. It's a really fine student resource. Um, but basically, I think that templates and your personal reputation is going to be much more valuable um, as a source for ad hoc uh, inquiries and hiring and, and cash and, and, and so forth. And I think over time, just like Amazon and eBay, uh, people are going to get rated. And the people doing the rated, rating are going to get rated. And so if you have a moron constantly giving you a one, eventually he wipes himself out. Okay? Um, but I think our personal reputation and tagging all data with who collected it is going to eventually help create this citizen world brain uh, concept. I think data absolutely must have attributes about everyone who has touched it, the chain of custody, if you will. Um, yeah, like we used to do in evidence when, when I was shaking down my Marines for drugs, you know, when I found drugs in their socks, I had to actually have a, a receipt for every person that touched that all the way up to the courtroom. Uh, and so I think information is going to need to have a chain of custody and, and biases and attributes and all of that. And in this day and age, that's a, that's a simple thing to do. Yes, sir? Have you looked at all at the DOD metadata repository? Um, it's at xml.dod.mil. They're doing a lot of the stuff you're talking about, geospatial um, coordination and stuff, but I don't think all the attributes like data integrity are in there. Do you have any comments on that? Um, Paul Straussman, who was the director of defense information, is a friend of mine, and he tried hard. He came up with this concept of corporate information management, and I extended it to global information management. The bottom line is that DOD is over 2,000 fiefdoms, none of which give a shit about any of the others. Um, and I'm sure there are wonderful efforts across DOD that I'm not familiar with, and that sounds like something I'd love to get an email on. Um, but the bottom line for me is I think we need an internet standards process for data. I don't think NIST is working, uh, as best I can tell. Do you have a follow-up? Well, I'm just aware they're building a DOD metadata repository now. They're getting the standards put together for the templates and the document type definitions. Um, but it's all like beta from what I've seen. Are they asking for public comment? I believe so, yes. Well, that's good. That's, yeah. that's progress. Um, any other questions? 
Okay, quick spy story. There I was in a McDonald's in a Central American country wearing my goatee and in the tropical heat it started to come off. So I finished the rest of the meeting like this. <laughs> Next. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, if we're going to be collecting this data for you. No, you're not collecting for me. You're collecting for yourself, but go okay. ahead. So how are we going to be given access to the data? Or are we going to give, be given access to the data? I don't have all the solutions, but I think that we have failed to harness the volunteer uh, manpower, and we have also failed to get to microcache to the point where it's effective. Um, I would like to get to microcache, I'd like to get to e-copyright, I'd like to get to audit trails, and these are all things way beyond my technical competence. Um, my IT guy is Steve Arnold uh, from Arnold Information Technologies in Kentucky. Um, and uh, we talked to NQTEL and others. Um, basically, I think we need to restore the idea of an information commons, and the internet begins that process. But the real data is the data that is in protected databases. And one of the reasons that I want to increase security on the internet is because I want to increase the prospects for sharing stuff uh, with more and more people. Yes, sir. In terms of how are you going to get, or how do you propose people actually use the data? And not use the data, but kind of that cultural reform. Is it lead by example? Is it to show people, hey, this is what you can get over here, as opposed to right now you've got, like you said, the 2,000 fiefdoms. What's their incentive to go with this other program, that they can do their job better? That's yeah. a big part of it. I, I just paid $1,500 for a CEO sales course. CEO uh, selling to CEO. And it's interesting because, because my whole life I've been trying to explain things to people in a rational way. And, and they made it crystal clear to me, look, if it ain't about sex or profit or power, they're not going to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't try and sell them anything. Ask them what their problem is and then solve it. Uh, and then explain to them that the reason you cost three times as much is because they're not adding up the hidden costs of doing it with the other guy. Um, that's in a nutshell. Now you don't have to pay the 1500 Thank uh, you. <laughs> But I, I realize we really haven't done a good job of holding people accountable for being stupid. Um, and my 14-year-old hates the Fairfax County school system, which is a pretty good school system. Uh, but he got an F in biology, and his excuse was an acceptable one to me. He says, Dad, I was bored. The last quarter, she just showed videos. I can understand that. I'd be not only bored, but pissed. I mean, he got an A the quarter that they were doing lab work. Uh, this is a kid that spent nine hours waiting to catch a fish, okay? I have no doubts about his intelligence or his perseverance. I do have doubts about, you know, the teachers kind of getting lazy and using videos as a substitute for being teachers. Um, and so I don't have all the answers, but I think Google has come a long way. The internet has come a long way. I don't like Google answers. I think Google is sitting on an $8 billion a year pot of gold, and they are so hung up on their goddamn algorithms that they're not willing to do commercial intelligence. Uh, because if you take the bell curve for the people that use Google, put me on one end. I spend $5,000 to $10,000 a year buying books and things on the internet. Um, that doesn't count the two or 300,000 I, I pay for consultants and things like that. Uh, but I, as an individual, 5,000 bucks. And then at the bottom, put zero. The median point maybe is $500. Google is sitting on $8 billion a year in on-demand information sales, and I don't think Google Answers is the way to go. Um, so do you have any other comment? Uh, so you're proposing more of a, you're thinking at least along the lines of a top-down, hold accountable, and that'll propagate down through the organization versus... I know, think it's a pull or, system. It's okay. not a push system. And okay. it's a system in which the pull is, is accompanied by accountability, audit, and attributes of every person that's touched that data uh, so that you know who's touched that data. And actually, you can even convene a, a meeting about that data. You know, with one button, you hit every person who's touched it and you give them a financial or sexual incentive for having a conversation. <laughs> okay, next person. Slowly. Yes. So you talked about um, how education contributes to this um, as one of the people wearing the academic button. Um, how, what is a basic toolkit in your opinion for educating citizens for a society that will help make 
intelligence, you know, for everyone possible. Just either kids, you know, on up through adults, like adult education as well as child education. We, someone smarter than me said that we've spent a hundred years perfecting a school system that creates factory workers. Um, I think that's right. Uh, we're not teaching kids how to learn. We're basically paying for very expensive childcare. Um, and we're doing in 18 years what could probably be done in five um, if we really went at it in a more intelligent way. Uh, I personally believe that we should move to a new uh, triad system in which people spend one third of their time studying, one third of their time traveling or in internships or community service, and one third of their time working every year of their life, okay? Uh, we are completely out of touch with what we need. But if I can ask a follow-up, on a really basic level, um, just for, at the point of dealing with the information, what kinds of things do people need to know? The reason that I'm creating this nonprofit in Stockholm, because I, I think the Swedes have replaced the Canadians as the trusted third party, and we're creating it with nine languages. It's Golden Candle Society in nine different languages. I need to buy the domain names next week, so please don't beat me to it. Um, <laughs> But um, what I want to do is recruit retired intelligence professionals from all seven tribes, and I want to create a standard educational package on the proven process of intelligence. Um, the proven process of intelligence is significantly different from academic research in, in some ways. Um, generally, anything that is broadcast or is published for general distribution is research. Intelligence is about answering an important question for someone specific who is going to take an action or do something that, that actually makes a financial or sexual difference in their lives. Okay, these guys really drove it home to me here. Um, um, and so, for example, I had a general, I had a, I had a, a two-star general send a one-star general a, a, an email. He said, tell me everything about mining U.S. harbors. And so this one star sent it to a colonel who sent it to me, and we spent $3,000 and four man days figuring out all of the ways that, that ports could be mined, air mines, land mines, sea mines. Sent back to two stars, said, this isn't what I wanted. What I wanted to know was how could a U.S. militant close a U.S. port? It's a completely different question. And because the one star didn't have the balls to ask the two star, sir, why do you want to know, and what context, and so forth, we wasted $3,000 in four-man days. Uh, getting the question right is very important. Requirements analysis, uh, requirements definition. You really have to understand what it is you want to know and why and when and how long the answer should be and just how much money you want to spend. Do you want a $5 answer or do you want a $5,000 answer? So requirements definition. Then collection management, knowing who knows. I am appalled at the number of people that don't understand citation analysis. Using the Social Science Citation Index or the Science Citation Index, both published by the Institute of Scientific Information, created by Eugene Garfield, one of America's most brilliant people, uh, I can find out for $1,000, 500 bucks in a dialogue ranking command and 500 bucks in analyst time, I can find out who the top 100 people in the world are on anything. If I have to do a study on left-handed Lithuanians with earwax problems, I can find the top 10 guys uh, or gals or in-betweens uh, on that. And then I call up, I, I decide, or my client decides what citizenships are acceptable, and I call up the top guy and I say, hey, I want to send you a check for 2000 uh, And he says, oh, no one's ever called me and said that before. And I said, well, here's what I want you to do. And I don't want it to take more than four to six hours of your time, and oh, by the way, I want the answer within three working days. And they do and I do. Uh, and so there are very few people I can't hire overnight on a phone call. Uh, and I don't bother hiring just anybody, I only hire people who are in the top 10 to 100 uh, in their selected field. And oh, by the way, they know the 100 that don't publish, who are in government or elsewhere. And then source discovery and validation. I mean, I think source discovery and validation is extremely important and we're not paying enough attention to it. Uh, most of what is available on the internet, most of what is available from commercial media is crap. Um, we now talk about blue OSINT and black OSINT. Blue OSINT is new knowledge created on the fly. Using legal and ethical methods, including groundwalkers and, and uh, $4 a day PhDs and, and stuff like that, 
uh, we will actually go and do interviews, take pictures, do whatever. And we will create knowledge that is not available in books or newspapers or magazines uh, or dissertations. Black OSINT is OSINT that's so good I don't want you to know I can do it uh, because the sources will dry up just as, uh, just as they dry up when secret sources and methods are blown. Uh, and we're doing black OSINT now. Um, so I think what people need to know is that there is a process of intelligence, that there is a discipline and patience and methodology of learning and, and research and intelligence, um, and that if you want to play video games all your life, that's fine, but you're going to go hungry. Uh, you know, and I'm having this discussion with my 14-year-old. It's driving me crazy. I mean, he really thinks he can make it as a hamburger flipper at McDonald's. Um, Merv. Did that answer your question? Okay, next, sir. Uh, hi. Um, just, you were talking about standards before, and I, I guess I'm one of those people that's, the other people that are really excited about the idea of collective intelligence, and I believe there's some standards that DOD's been working on called DAML and OIL, which are both based on top of RDF um, for allow, allowing information to be found and shared and more easily classified than perhaps you could in a standard RDBMS. And the standard I'm most excited about is called Topic Maps, and I wonder if you've heard about that. I'm pretty sure some of these technologies could be of use. To well, you. I would love to. I would love to see a dialogue emerge on that. I'd certainly welcome an email. At, uh, you can get my card or send an email to bear at oss.net. I mean, I Arnold handles the technical questions, and, and other people handle the technical questions. Um, so don't look to me as as being intelligent about standards or anything like that. But I think the discussion needs to be held. Uh, Vince Cerf, I think, did a tremendous job setting a voluntary, rapid internet standards process. Uh, there are also people like Robert Herman, who ran ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, who hate standards. Uh, they think standards are the enemy of progress. Um, I personally think better is the enemy of good enough, and I think proprietary is the enemy of progress. Um, and so we need to have standards that are good enough. Uh, for sharing. And I mean, one of the things I've stopped doing is it really pisses me off that my U.S. government client requires that I use Microsoft. Um, and so I've started posting as much as I can in RTF uh, just because it makes me angry that DOC and PPT aren't translatable and migratable and all these other things. Can, can I? Sorry, I had Yeah, you can thing. do whatever you want. All right. Um, I was actually going to ask a smart-ass question, so it's good that you just said that. Here's my smart-ass question. Earlier on, you said that, you know, given the choice between incompetence and conspiracy, always choose incompetence. Now, in 1999, there was a B-1 uh, bomber blew, uh, flew over from the States to Kosovo and dropped two B-1 bombs on the Chinese embassy in the middle of the Kosovo war. And afterwards, they said, well, we had the wrong map. We were working from a tourist map from 19... Yeah. Do you honestly believe that? Well, I've heard two competing stories. They're both believable, but the, the incompetence one is more believable. Um, the, the, the conspiracy or deliberate attack thing is that that was the intelligence section of the Chinese embassy, and they were getting too big for their britches in an area that we considered to be our preserve. Uh, they were running arms and doing other things, and, and it was a very deliberate attack on China. I'm less inclined to believe that in part because I don't think they've actually been very active out there um, compared to what they're doing, say, against the Uyghurs. Um, the incompetence one, and, and by the way, as this was happening, I had a Russian 1997 uh, 10,000 scale map of Belgrade uh, on my office wall from Eastview Publications, Eastview, Cartogra Eastview Cartographic in, in Minneapolis, which is my geospatial counterpart. The U.S. government is very reluctant to use Russian military maps and other foreign maps because Jim Clapper and NGA really think they can do a better job with one meter imagery and, um, and the shuttle mission data, which got us the digital terrain elevation data. And so they try and create stuff on the fly. The problem is they're not fast enough. I have U.S. government clients that come to me for Russian military maps in digital and hard copy because NGA can't meet their time deadlines. Um, let me diverge for just a moment. I really believe that imagery and geospatial information is extremely important. Now, let me tell you about one of the problems with relying on classified imagery. 
Classified imagery is basically like having a bucket full of postage stamps. And these postage stamps have been taken at different years, different seasons, different times of day, different angles of look, okay? And so when you combine all these postage stamps with the digital terrain elevation data, you get something that's almost incomprehensible in my experience. Whereas if you take commercial imagery, 10 meter spot, which by the way, and I had to tell NGA that spot had two satellites, which meant that it had a revisitation of, of every two days, not every 30 days. Okay, but you take 10 meter commercial imagery for the broad swath, you get a nice clean wide area look, you bring in the digital terrain elevation data, then you slide in the Russian. It takes hundreds of man years to do the data extraction from imagery to convert that into a chart as cultural features and contour lines and all of that. And, and then in the Chinese embassy case, you ask a defense attache that's been there recently who will tell you you have the wrong address. And, and this was the one target picked by CIA, and I actually believe that it was picked in error. Um, that's my personal belief. I have no access to privileged or classified information. But truly, in my 30 years or more of, of experience in the classified world, incompetence beats conspiracy every time. Um, yes, sir. Uh, you uh, mentioned the Peace Corps both the other morning and today. And I was wondering what you saw as the benefits of the Peace Corps. Um, is it merely the immediate benefits of what the people involved do? by building bridges and infrastructure, whatever, or is it more a matter of uh, goodwill with other nati nations on top of the immediate benefits? The Peace Corps should be 10 to 50 times larger, and we should double or triple the, uh, the salaries and the, and the compensation. Uh, we should do that as part of a larger integrated strategy. There is no one in the U.S. government whether in the State Department, CIA, or anywhere, there is no one in the U.S. government that has a finger on every single U.S. government program going into any single country. Okay, so Sudan, for example. There are at least 150 action officers, only 15 to 20 of whom are talking to each other. Okay, and so you have these obscure little law enforcement programs and these obscure little things. And then if you add to that all the faith-based diplomacy and the NGO actions and the business actions, it's all out of control. Um, I've forgotten your question. Uh, extent of the Peace Corps benefit, oh. whether it's merely immediate or whether it has long-reaching cultural I, I have come to the conclusion that we need to spend $500 billion a year on overseas preventive measures, including having a, a minimal big war force. If we don't stabilize the world, if we don't stop illegal migration, if we don't stop trading women and children, if we don't stop ethnic criminal gangs, and I, ethnic criminal gangs is one man, one bullet, and I really don't give a shit about a trial. Um, you know, we have to get tough, but the problem is we're not smart enough to be tough. We're not smart enough to identify these guys and track them down in their holes. Uh, and at the same time, we're creating more terrorists every day than we're killing. Um, you know, I think it's absolutely ludicrous to, to be in Iraq as an occupying force rather than as a, a peaceful force. I think we busted the piggy bank. Uh, and so we need a national strategy that is actually coherent and uses all of the instruments of national power. Joe Nye did a pretty good book on this. Uh, not the soft power book, which is a shallow book, uh, but the earlier one on, um, what was it called? Who, who remembers Joe Nye's next to last book? No, well, you guys got to read more uh, uh, in my area. But anyway, you can read my reviews. Um, there is no government program, for example, for the Pacific region that says, okay, here are all the State Department programs, here are all the AID programs, here are all the Peace Corps programs, here are all the special operations and military programs. And one of the things I told the guys at Fort Bragg is, your civil affairs and PSYOP stuff ain't worth shit if we're not delivering water and food. I mean, you could do all the hearts and minds crap you want, but if we're not delivering water and food, it, it kind of lacks credibility. Um, and so the U.S. government right now, David Abshire wrote the world's longest job description. It was, called, it was a book called Preventing World War III. It, the entire book was focused on describing the position of counselor to the president for strategic thinking. Um, and in my first book, I end with suggesting four major reforms in the, in the office of the presidency. I think the presidency has become too complicated to just elect one man 
who then picks his buddies. Uh, I think we need to elect a team. I think presidential candidates need to be required to identify their cabinets in advance of election. Um, we need to have a national office of strategic thinking with a grand strategy division that thinks ahead and a crisis management division that manages interagency uh, operations to, to respond to crises. We need to elevate the intelligence community. I'd, I'd make the next director of national intelligence equivalent of the Federal Reserve, a nonpartisan professional. One of the problems we have is most people, most DCIs have no clue what they're doing. Uh, they're coming in out of the political side. John Lehman will be an absolute disaster as a director of central intelligence uh, if he gets it. Porter Goss would be partially educatable, um, but Porter's still hung up on having been a case officer. And I think congressional oversight over intelligence has been uh, grossly negligent for the past 10 years. And so Porter's got a lot to atone for, um, but I don't think he realizes that. Um, so the Peace Corps is an important piece. I think Americans are good-hearted, decent people. I would particularly like to see us sending out Muslim Peace Corps workers. Uh, no Muslim, in my experience, is going to listen to a white boy from Kansas. Um, and so we really need to leverage our melting pot. And, and we're not doing that. Let's leave it there and come back to it another time, OK? Uh, you can hit me. I'll be here till 2. Yes, sir? We have a three and a half uh, months uh, to election. And uh, almost every uh, uh, part of uh, government is assuming that something will be happen. This will be about 27 uh, October and uh, about 100th anniversary of opening a subway in New York. And if we assume uh, uh, that uh, we can fix uh, borders, uh, close borders to uh, uh, came here and uh, two, three guys, bad guys, they can attack easy and uh, uh, three methods. One will be, for example, dirty bomb, some type biological. Do you have a question? and eventually uh, some tunnel like subway. What do you think, uh, if agree if you, with your knowledge, where will be this attack? Because it's almost... Well, first off, I think sure. there are over a thousand sleeper uh, people in the United States. And some of them have married blonde, blue-eyed babes and have had children by these blonde, blue-eyed babes, and they don't know that they're cover for action. Um, that at some point in time, the guy will fill the soccer van with the family and, and use that to do something really horrific that includes suicide. Um, so we have a lot of sleepers in the United States, a lot of Hamas, a lot of Pakistani bad boys. Um, and just to take an example from Pakistan, which is now exporting terrorism by official government policy to Bangladesh, Kashmir, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and now Phuket. Phuket, Thailand is a Bali waiting to happen. Um, the south part of Thailand is mostly Muslim, Malay Muslims, and they've basically been on the short end of the stick. And I will come back to the United States in a minute. They've been on the short end of the stick in terms of Thai uh, cultural bigotism toward them. And so they get the bottom of the barrel in terms of government assistance and school projects and things like this. Um, and what's happening now is basically the Pakistanis in particular are trying to export terrorism into southern Thailand and they're trying to, they're trying to take these legitimate local grievances and then turn them into armed insurrection. Uh, Thailand is going to become a lot uglier um, uh, in the next year or two. Uh, early in this year there were a large number of people killed. Um, uh, in Thailand. Now coming back to the United States, or this is a Pakistani example, in Naples we found 28 Pakistanis in an apartment building with 100 cell phones, maps of all the NATO facilities, and enough explosives to take out a three-story building. They are all over this country. Okay? Closing the borders is not going to stop this. And we can't close the borders anyway. It's impossible. Um, I've actually been out on a, uh, when I was a CIA mid-career course, which is like our war college, uh, I went out to the San Diego border and we watched them herd people with horses. Um, 
you know, it's, it's impossible to control our border with, with the way things are going. Now, after 9-11, they stopped coming because they thought we might shoot them. Uh, but after about two or three days, they figured out we wouldn't shoot them and the borders became porous again. Um, 